Welcome to Inspirational Leadership. I'm your host, Kristen Harcourt, and excited for another special, fabulous guest. And today we are going to be talking to Shed. Stephen Shedletsky, or Shed to his friends, helps leaders listen and nurture the voice of others. He supports humble leaders that put their people and purpose first. All, all while knowing they are both a part of the problems they experience and part of the solutions they seek to create. A sought after speaker, coach, and advisor, Shed has led hundreds of keynote presentations, workshops, and leadership development programs around the world. As a thought leader on psychological safety in the workplace, he works with leaders in all industries where human beings work. His latest book is called Speak Up Culture, When Leaders Truly Listen, People Step Up. Welcome to the show, Shed. Thank you so much, Kristen. A delight to join you. I am, as always, super excited for this conversation, and I always say the same thing. I wish I had days because I think we could dive into so much stuff today. But as a starting point, I always love to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit around your journey and your story and what got you to this work you're doing in the world. Absolutely. Thank you. And it's fun to follow in the coattails of my mentor and dear friend, Leanne Davey, who I know is the last <laughs> guest or a recent guest. So if you yeah. haven't listened to that episode, stop what you're doing right now and go listen to the <laughs> Leanne Davey episode first. Um, so, uh, I mean, my career, like I think so many others, are a series of happy accidents. I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was older and whatever I thought I, you know, I wanted to be hasn't come true. But in many respects, um, so much of it has. Uh, so I realized very early on in my career, more so from what was missing than what was present, that I really cared about um, feeling engaged in our work. We work on average 90,000 hours in our lives. You might as well enjoy those hours and, and feel fulfilled. Use our strengths, of which we all have strengths, to contribute towards something bigger than ourselves that we care about and bigger than, than profit. Um, so I stumbled into uh, the Ivy Business School at Western Ontario. Love that, that experience. I sort of called it a career accelerator. Um, did a quick internship where I met Leanne Davey at Knightsbridge Leadership Solutions, which was amazing. Really enjoyed it. And um, my first job out of biz school was with Petro Canada turned Suncor. Mm -hmm. On my first day, a thousand people were let go post merger. And so I was walking in as many more folks were were walking out. And um, it was a really interesting experience to witness lack of transparency from leaders, lack of psychological safety, simply just a tumultuous, uncertain time. I remember the the woman next to me, you know, across my 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 cubicle was like a 37 year veteran of the company. And she was sitting there nervous that her pink slip was going to arrive next. And so you know, I was thankful that was my first job and not something I had been in for decades so that I could be curious with it as opposed to freaked out or attached to it. Um, and, you know, I had a ton of reflection on that first job to really figure out what is it that I want when I felt unmotivated and unfulfilled. At first, I made it, you know, my problem and me, mm. like what's wrong with me? Why am I not motivated and fulfilled versus perhaps why is this not for me? Um, my grandfather is a huge inspiration of mine. My grandfather sacrificed a lot to give me and my family a shot at this thing called life. And so I, I, I reflected what was he doing at this point in his life, which gave me a ton of courage to pursue things that I really cared about. So long story short, I ended up being introduced to Simon Sinek's work, mm -hmm. um, ended up working with Simon Sinek for over a decade, um, and then just I, I became so crystal clear that the work I want to do is to help as many people as possible gain meaning from the work that they do, um, feel inspired by their work, feel psychologically safe, feel fulfilled by the work that they do, which simply makes the world a far better place. So that's my my commitment. Um, and with this book that just came out a couple months ago, it's really around what are the cultures that leaders can cultivate where people feel that it's safe and worth it to actually speak up and, mm -hmm. and share what they think, share what they feel to make things better. Mm. I love that. I resonate really deeply with what you're saying, because I think I, I, I see some similarities in, on, in my journey. And, and I always say it didn't happen to me. It happened for me because as someone who graduated, you could, I would really consider myself a generalist. I could go in any direction. And what does that direction look like? 
and through having some difficult experiences with some toxic cultures and leaders who, again, they did the best they could with what they knew how to do, but just didn't have the tools and really behaved in, in a way that isn't creating um, a, a culture of psychological safety and having several leaders like that in a row. And then luckily having several amazing leaders right after to be able to show the contrast recognize, oh, wow, like what a shift can be created if we have those leaders with the right skills and just recognize that those leaders didn't have the skills and didn't have somebody helping them to understand there's a different way and a different version. So I, I really connect with what you're saying. I, I, I say this a lot. A lot of people don't wake up in the morning asking themselves, how can I be an a-hole today? <laughs> right? Like that's not the goal. The boss hole. They're not like driving boss over hole, yeah. Okay, as I drive to work, like who can I create problems for and be a difficult person for? That's not the goal. It's just they're going about things in a way that's not necessarily going to really set themselves or others for success. And and whether they know it or not, you know, the the irony of of stepping into roles of leadership is the more senior you get, the further away you typically get from the truth. Yes. Um, and the typical, typically the further way you get from a customer as well. Yes. Um, but leaders need to be obsessed with what's the condition I'm, cr- I'm creating to hear truth and then reward it when it arrives, especially if it's hard to hear. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm so, I'm so with you. I mean, I say the, the very exact same thing around most leaders want to do a good job. We just haven't adequately defined what it means to lead. We then yes. haven't selected leaders against said definition. And yes. then, we don't help leaders lead. You know, there's there's a stat from Zenger that the average age of someone becoming a first time people manager is 29, and the average age of them getting formal leadership development training is the age 39. There's a 10 year gap on average between when folks get the actual role of leadership and when we give them any training. Um, so there's a lot of work, a lot of work to be done, and I'm I'm here for it. And it's so interesting, as you say that I almost feel like, oh, wow, you know, 29 to 39. That's actually not bad. I think about some of the leaders I work with in their 50s, who are now 50s, late 50s, who say, oh, my gosh, I wish I had if I'm doing individual coaching or doing training. I wish someone had pulled me aside and made this available and invested in this way back in, like you're saying, 20s, early 30s, because I would have um, handled things a lot differently. And I would also say there is an appetite for it. Even some of the language where I see how we've shifted as a culture in our workplaces, some of the language that I felt comfortable using 10 now, 10 years ago, I was very, so, so my husband's an engineer. So I use him as a gauge. I say, what do you hear when I say this word? (laughs) And so many, I, I don't know what that is, but it sounds a little bit scary. So it's just so interesting to see how that's evolved in terms of what we're even talking about, because using words like, I could say care, but even using words like love and not romantic love, but showing love and showing care, I felt that there was a lot of resistance to even hearing those kind of words as, as early as 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And there's been great, I mean, it, one of the things that I think the pandemic did is it accelerated a lot of the agenda of emotions show up at work, Yeah, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, it's yes. because you're human. Yes. Um, that's why I, I love Susan's, Susan, David work, Susan David's work around emotions are data, yes. you know, and if you resist that, that data, it just rears its, its, its ugly head louder um, later, you know? Yes. Um, and, and, you know, I think that there are so many offerings now that have made coaching more and more accessible. You also, all you need for a leadership development program is to pick an appropriate book and study it together. Mm-hmm. Boom, exactly. leadership development program. So exactly. It doesn't Agreed. need to be so cost invasive. Exactly. Exactly. There's lots of different options of how you can approach it. Uh, So tell me, I loved when I was, uh, when I first went to your website and I started to hear you talking about your core beliefs, because I think that's such a great place to start with, right? Foundationally. And so you have four really important core beliefs. Tell me more about those and why they're so important. So the, and I'll just list them um, because I think it's, you know, we can just work with it. So the, I, we actually have five on there. Um, and they're all very much behavior based. So, and the first three are kind of similar. So, uh, leadership cannot be claimed. It must be earned. Mm -hmm. Culture cannot be declared. It must be lived. Yes. Leaders truly listen and then make it fun and pursue fulfillment 
not happiness. So yes. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight, I'll highlight a few. So you, you mentioned um, before um, skills, skills of leadership of which there are definitely skills. Um, I like to differentiate um, with the work from my friend, Rich Devini, who wrote this book right here for anyone who's not, who's just listening to audio. It's a book called the, the attributes. So Rich is a retired U S seal yes. and he, he began to, select folks to join elite SEAL teams. Mm. And it wasn't that they weren't skilled, like they, they had all the right skills, um, but there were certain folks who either f he felt or there was data through how they behaved that they would thrive in a team or not. Yes. And so what Rich calls attention to are attributes. Mm -hmm. So skills are taught or learned. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a lot easier to test, measure and assess for a skill um, uh, but yeah, if, if you can teach it or it can be taught, it's a skill, um, uh, typing, talking, walking, riding a bike, um, wow. even listening is a skill, right. Um, but take, take riding a bike or listening. So when you're riding a bike and you fall off and scrape your knee, now your attributes are showing, <laughs> yeah. right. Are you persistent? Do you hop back on? With a bloody right. knee and keep going yeah. or do you need a three-week break until you and a bike can be in the same room which by the way none of that is bad it just is yes. it just is right so there's this these other more innate things that we are born with certain levels of these and certainly can develop them but like some of us based on our nurture and nature are more empathetic mm -hmm. than others mm -hmm. but like i can't teach empathy um, but if you find the value in empathy, you can go on a developmental journey to become more empathetic. And yeah. for some of us, it's easier. And for some of us, it's it's harder, but it still can be done. Now, the goal it may not necessarily to be a 10 out of 10 or 11 out of 10 out of, out of empathy, because any strength overdone or can, can derail, right? Yeah. Like a like a empathetic stand up, com stand up comedian, not so funny, right? right. you know? <laughs> And also, if you're an 11 out of 10 on empathy as a nurse, as an example, or a teacher, as an example, that weighs on you. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's an optimal level of empathy, yes. like a seven or a seven and a half for certain roles, as an example. Yes. Um, but I, I, I like pointing out the difference between skills and, and attributes, because attributes are, are more innate. It's why I say leaders truly listen. Because mm. truly for me means that you're combining the leadership superpowers of compassion and empathy yeah. with listening. Nice. Because you can use listening as a skill to manipulate folks to use the information to get them against them or get them to do what you want. That's that that's good listening, but yeah. it's manipulative intent. Yeah. So um, that's why I put the word truly in the subtitle of the book. When leaders truly listen, people step up. Um, and my, my editor is like, you don't need that word. It's, it's, it's useless. And I'm like, no, 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 it's very useful. And I'll explain because it's that empathy and compassion with, with listening. So I'm just a big fan of, you know, leadership cannot be claimed. It must be earned. Culture cannot be declared. It must be lived that the test of our leadership, the test of our culture, the test of our parenthood, our friendship, you know, anything that is useless if we label ourselves if i'm like hey kristen i'm a really great parent mm -hmm. it's like oh i'm like i'm really trustworthy you know mm -hmm. i'm such a great listener yeah. it's like bs like show me through your behavior yeah you know if you observe me parenting and you're like wow great parenting shed if my kids say i'm a great parent if my wife said like now that's meaningful data so i'll lean in again to my present favorite quote on leadership that comes from Rich Devinney, which mm. is leaders aren't born. Leaders aren't made. Leaders are chosen based upon the way that they behave mm. and culture is in our behavior always. Mm. I love that. And that's an important distinction. I probably didn't even notice I was using the word skills because everybody who's listening to the podcast knows that I'm talking about behaviors yes. all the time. So thank you for um, re-accentuating that. I think it's super, super important. And I love where you went with that quote as well, right? I think that, and I, I talk a lot about leadership as well, that leadership is an opportunity, but it's also a responsibility. Leadership doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy. There's can be lots of difficult moments. And I think sometimes people don't necessarily take time to really reflect on what, what it really means to step into 
and be a leader and be able to show up for people in that way. And, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit around cultures. And when it comes to creating psychological safety, everyone on the podcast who is a regular listener will know this is something that shows up a lot in our conversations around creating psychological safety and specifically creating a space where people not only are feeling safe to speak up, but are also encouraged to speak up. So talk to me a little bit more around you and I would just think, come on organizations, why wouldn't everybody on, be on board with this? And yet they're not. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit more around what do you think some of the be barriers are from yeah. creating these kinds of environments? And then I'm going to give you a magic wand and let you tell us what you would like to see more of in terms of what we're going to create and evolve, evolve in that way. Beautiful, beautiful. And yeah, and just to point out as well, skills aren't unimportant. Skills are very yes, important, but it's both. that mixture of skills, attributes, yes. behaviors. So yes. yes. Um, so, so psychological safety. I'm a fan. Um, I first came across the word actually reading Adam Grant's book, Give and Take. There's mm. like a little note of like psychological safety, C. Amy C. Edmondson. Yeah. I'm like, ooh, what is this work? <laughs> um, and so, so a couple of things. I mean, one, the way um, Amy defines psychological safety is an environment in which people feel safe taking interpersonal risk. And so one of the myths around psychological safety is that we wrap people in bubble paper and, and only treat them nice. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. And a lot of research and a lot of the conversation around psychological safety gets it wrong um, for that reason, that it's that they think it's a culture of nice. It is not a culture of nice. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, a culture or a culture of comfort. It's a culture where we can embrace and use discomfort as data and as a superpower. It is not a culture of nice. It's a culture of kind. Mm -hmm. um, I never loved the term, though. And I never loved the term because I felt as though we put an academic lab coat on a very human experience mm -hmm. and emotion. Yeah. Ironically, I, I heard Amy recently share um, that she used the term psychological safety because it was inherited. Um, she wrote a paper early in her career. One of the reviewers of that paper said, oh, you're talking about psychological safety, to which her response was, whatever gets me published. Sure. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> Right. So, so she, Amy herself admits not the best term. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a term that she made up. It's actually from 1960. Um, and so when I started writing this book, Speak Up Culture, I fully thought that I was simply rebranding mm -hmm. psychological safety. I, mm -hmm. I thought I was writing, uh, a, a friend of mine, Tiz Tiziana Cacciaro asked me, are you writing different things or are you writing things differently mm. at first i only thought i was writing things differently mm -hmm. but as i delved into the work which i now called speak up culture it isn't only is it safe to speak up it's also is it worth it ah yeah because it, we'll it can be that. safe right it can be safe but you keep going back to that well and it's dry and eventually apathy sets in because yes. no change happens. Exactly. So the phenomena of a speak up culture is it is both safe and it's worth it. But yes. sometimes it isn't safe, but it's still worth it. Cue in Ed Pearson at Boeing with the 737 Max. It wasn't safe for him to speak up, but he felt so connected to human life and the stakes of what was going on that at personal risk, he still spoke up. It wasn't yeah. a speak up culture because speak up is not an instruction. It's an environment. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a culture. Mm -hmm. So now to answer your question head on of um, why doesn't every workplace have a speak up culture or psychological safety? And the reason is, is because it's really hard work. It's exceptionally hard work and it's feeling based work. It's mm -hmm. culture work. Yeah. Um, harder to measure, harder to do, and really, really important. It's also the antithesis of controlling people, and it's the antithesis of straight hierarchy. And yeah. so it's just hard work. And by the way, there's no set it and forget it when it comes to leadership development or culture. There's no Tuesday morning that we all wake up and it's like, oh, we're done. We're here. Is, We've arrived. Yeah. Nothing We've else arrived. to do. <laughs> you never arrive. You are always arriving. Yes. And you and the team constantly grows and morphs and evolves, as does the world around us. So it's hard work. It's hard to measure. It's more so feeling based, but it is ever important for safety and for performance and for innovation. So yes. um, 
yeah, I've I've identified that a speak up culture is one in which it is safe and worth it. And then mm -hmm. also the two behaviors that leaders display on repeat to create a speak up culture, and you identified one, is both encourage folks to speak up and then yeah. reward them when they do. Right. And a, and a reward doesn't necessarily mean an extrinsic re reward, like a pay increase, bonus, raise, you know, statue made in one's honor. It's far more intrinsic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you. That must have taken courage. We didn't implement your idea, but here's why. Um, so it's those two, encourage and reward, and then it can positively or negatively ripple. Um, yes. Meaning, you know, positive speak up interactions beget more positive speak up interactions, and the opposite is uh, is just as true as well. Um, yeah, I have more to more to say on the topic, but I'll I'll pause there. Yeah, I think even as I hear you talking, um, for sure around the productivity and innovation, I think about just even on the individual level, feeling more. Um, more purpose and meaning and fulfillment because you now have an opportunity to feel like you can speak up and say what you want to say and feel like someone's going to do with um, what you have to say. And that, cause we, it's like you have these things and you're, you're aligned with your values and it's bubbling up, but then you feel shut down if you're not getting to speak in that way. The other thing I wanted to share with what you just said there that feels connected because I've heard this before too, this culture of nice. It's like, no, no, there's going to be people who they feel safe and they're going to say, we, we have some things that we need to address. There are, I think about the engagement surveys and when people are speaking up in engagement surveys and especially ones where they're not actually confidential and they're sharing and yet nothing happens after the people are speaking up and sharing. I was also was, was thinking about, I, I remember Kim Scott hearing her in a couple of interviews around radical candor um, in the same way where people would say, oh, oh, this radical candor, it just means I can say whatever I want to say. And, and I saw, I, I had clients who told me like, this is what's happening. The, the leadership feels like, oh, it just means that I don't need to anything that I want to say, I can start to share. No, 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 that's not the yeah. intent. So it was reminding me as you were sharing that too, with the psychological safety term, right? Those times where the term can be misinterpreted and now all of a sudden, and, it, and that's not the intention of the individual who was bringing this, this work out into the world and trying to create that movement. Yeah. Well, if, and so, I mean, let's face it, people don't read, people are more likely to read book covers than books. Right. And so you unfortunately pick up Kim Scott's book and you're like, oh, finally, here's my hall pass to be a jerk. <laughs> yeah. And that's not what it is. Um <laughs> And so I and I actually think it's one of the things that can be a misnomer with a, with a speak up culture, which is like, oh, everyone speaks up all the time about all the things that's chaotic and we don't get anywhere. And it's like, no, it's about context. So, you know, vulnerability isn't sharing all things at all times to all people. That's called yeah. oversharing. Yeah. So so I I didn't this didn't quite make it into the book, but I've since shared it as a as a blog and other pieces. And I incorporate it into my talks now that. Um, uh, there's a sweet spot when it comes to a speak up culture where it is generative, mm -hmm. it is productive, but yeah. tact, decency, respect, situational awareness, and emotional intelligence are bars. I think that that's that's the common denominator. Yeah. Now there's a spectrum. So what speak up is not a speak up culture is not sucking up. That's hogging air. Yeah. That's like oh boss says speak up all the time. Great. Blah 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 blah. It's like no. Sh shut up, yeah. uh, make space for others. The speak up culture yeah. is being an ally and carving space to hear the voices of others. It's around what needs to be said to help us move forward. Um, so if someone's sucking up, that's an opportunity to coach them and provide feedback on the intent. Their intent is not to serve, their intent mm -hmm. is to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. On the other end, um, some folks here speak up culture and they're like, great, Hall has to be a jerk, or they 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 don't know how to do it with tact and respect and decency and the right time and the right place. And some of that might be because we're not well practiced at this thing called confrontation, or there could be um, a, a a a neuro a neurodiverse component as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people will speak up and they have no idea that they're being abrasive or or um, inappropriate, but it's not for lack of positive intent. Right. That's a situation where you must reward the intent, but provide coaching and feedback on the behavior and the impact. So Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was going to, I mean, that's why I love that emotional intelligence is, is foundational on all of this as well, because people do, they need support around how to be able to communicate the message and be able to connect head and hearts, right? For yeah. some people that is not something that, beca- that comes naturally, but, and it is, a, it is something that can be learned through yes. support, through mentoring, through coaching. And guess what? It gets, it can feel messy, but it gets better the more you practice, right? So it's being able to create a space where they are practicing and recognizing it's a work in progress. Uh, I love that you called out the vulnerability piece because I've also, there's been times where I've also said, no, no, that is not vulnerability. Yeah. That is <laughs> oversharing. It is not, there needs to be boundaries around yeah. what's happening here. And even in a way where it can be, you know, senior leaders who feel, oh, if I'm being transparent, I need to share this, 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 this. No, 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 that's not, I love it. Again, like what you're saying from the positive intent, you really want to create a culture of transparency awesome that we still need to be cognizant of how that message context is communicated the context yeah yeah and the and uh, you know self-awareness is to even say like I, i'm thinking of folks who are who are more neurodiverse and they may not know that they're being abrasive right um but the, you can still say i've received feedback that sometimes i can say things and be a little bit you know abrasive or not aware of the impact. So warning, and yeah. here's my, here's what I think. And here's my, my yes. point of view, right? Yes. Just that little, you know, inoculation before what, what, what you say can really go a long way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the, the uh, magic wand piece. So you have the oh. magic wand, you get to go into organizations and you get to start to create some of these shifts. Mm-hmm. What does that look like for you? Where would you like to start to make shifts? Uh, you again, that's a magic wand, so you have fun with this. <laughs> so with with my magic wand, my my magic wand has a wonderful um, way to delineate between capital L and lowercase L leadership. Yeah. So for me, capital L leadership is you have the formal title, and there is an expectation and a formal responsibility for you to lead. Leadership is not a position, it's a disposition, it's a set of behaviors, and we've covered some of them, but I'll cover some more. It includes empathy and compassion, it includes authenticity, which does not mean warmth and charisma. Some of the best leaders that I know are consistently cold and grumpy, but I never had a doubt that they had my back and cared for me personally. Um, uh, leadership includes a service orientation. So I'm not a fan of the term servant leadership. It means that we don't have an adequate definition of what it means to lead. Right. It includes courage. It includes humility. It includes decisiveness and accountability. Like, I don't know if that's mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, but that's a pretty good start, right? Yeah. Um, and so those are the behaviors of, of leadership. If you have a capital L role of leadership, we expect you to behave as such. Not be perfect, yeah. but more moments than not behave that way. And when you behave outside of that, you own it, you clean it up and you course correct. Yes. Um, if you have the title, but do not display those behaviors, you are a title, you're a driver, you're a boss hole. Mm-hmm. Um, and that leader shit trickles down as well. Uh, so I feel for folks who are led by drivers because I've been there. It's hard and yeah. it's hard to be, you know, a counter leader to the example that you have yourself, hard work, um, a lot of energy. Yeah. The other is there's lowercase L leaders who may not be the most senior leaders, um, mm-hmm. but they have the behavior. And since they have the behavior, they have the people. Yeah. And so in with my magic wand, I would love for leaders to truly feel and understand the human impact of their work. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, a lot of the cases that I reference in the book, not all of them, but a good mm-hmm. chunk of them, are instances where um, uh, cultural failures have life and death impact. I'm talking healthcare, um, aerospace, nuclear, law enforcement, military, you know, list list goes, goes on. Yeah. Um, but we know from Gallup and UKG and the National Institute of Health that our relationship with our boss has more of an impact on our health and well-being than that of our relationship with our family doctor or our therapist if we have one. And then the relationship of that with our boss is at par from a health and well-being impact to that of our relationship with our life partner. That yeah. my magic wand has leaders understand yeah. the impact, the, the life-feeding or life-depleting impact that their 
actions and behaviors, the way that show up, that they show up has on the people um, around them. I mean, it's huge. And I love, thank you for sharing that stats. Cause I, I, I've seen other stats and I talk a lot, you know, two thirds of people quit their boss and a whole bunch of different things around the impact that a boss can have on the well-being, And again, impact gets to go both ways, right? Impact in terms of possibilities and what you can create and, and do in a really, really positive way. But unfortunately the impact that can have on the negative side, um, that's really, it's really disheartening. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that and to have that kind of data around it. And so there's going to be some leaders. I, I, uh, the leaders who listen to this podcast tend to be going from good to great. However, maybe you're going to pass along this podcast to someone who's not quite in that category yet, and they're wanting to move there. And so there's going to be a leader that might hear some of this and say, okay, I'm recognizing, you know, you know, I'd like to look at it, um, shed from both angles. One angle is going to be a leader is going to hear this and they're going to say, you know what, I, I want to start to get on board. I, I recognize that I'm not showing up as a leader that I want to be. Where can I start? We'll do that first. And then I would love to hear your perspective on somebody who's saying, yeah, I work for one of those leaders and I am, it is really, really impacting my energy, but I'm not in a place where I can leave that organization for a multitude of reasons. Yep. Cause I think a lot of times the answer we say is, you know, it's a bad organization. You should leave. And let's you be honest. There's a whole bunch of reasons why that's not possible for some people. Yep. And I, I never will ever be in a position where I, you know, unless I'm in a deeply personal coaching relationship or friendship, and I know the intimate details of someone's life, never will I ever say leave, you know? Um, and here's the funny thing as well, you know, you could work at a world-class amazing organization that is renowned for its leadership and culture and have a boss that isn't for you, or dare I say a, a bad boss. Yes. Similarly, you can be in an organization that has a horrible reputation and have the best boss of your career. Yes. Um, you know, culture isn't this uniform experience. Exactly. It is, it, it, it's always um, how the relationships feel with the people nearest to you. Um, so what are the two scenarios? You, you have someone who wants to go from good to great and then someone who works for a boss hole? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, I, I mean, he, here's the, here's the thing. Wherever you are in your leadership development journey, the fact that you're committing to your leadership development journey, that is good news. That is far more than the vast majority of folks are doing, which is sad, but great. Um, and for all the people around you that you wish would lead better, there's no number of anonymous books sent to leaders' offices that's going to make any change. You know, you can lead a horse to water. You cannot force them to drink. You can drown their head in the, in the, in the trough, but you can't force them to drink. Yeah. The only behavior you can influence 100% of the time is your own. That's it. So if you wish to show up as a better leader, show up as a better leader. Study those behaviors. Get feedback from people's opinions that you really value. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean you have to like like them or agree with them all the time, but you yes. have to respect them. Yeah. Um, do a 360. Get feedback. Not just once. <laughs> um, a lot. Um and commit to continue to work on your practice of, of leadership. Um, yes, that's what I would say. And, you know, there are good days and there are hard days, but you'll begin getting feedback over time. Well, people, people will say, you're my leader. I look up to you. I want to be more like you. How did you learn to be a great leader? Mm -hmm. um, you're one of the best leaders I've, I've had. I care about you. I'm, you know, all yes. those things. Yeah. Um, now, if you happen to work for someone that you would not consider to be a great leader, um, a couple things. I mean, know that not every leader is fit for every person and that you can still stay in the same organization and try to seek out a leader who you feel would more jive with your style without letting you off the hook to grow yourself. Mm-hmm. Again, regardless of the leadership that you're exposed to, you can choose your behavior. But again, I've been in situations where I've reported into a leader that was more of a boss hole than a leader. And it's really hard. It's just yeah. hard. There's no two yeah. ways about it. And you yeah. can be the best that, 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 that you can be. But in the end, you're sucking energy from your day by all the politicking and all the things you're having to do to, to manage up. You know, 
this isn't advice that I give all the time, but you you can or uh, this part I do. You can have empathy for someone who's leading you. And that, again, to what you said previous, very few leaders wake up in the morning and be like, how can I make my people's day worse? Very few. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, arrogance is just insecurity, but very loud. And so oftentimes, leaders display toxic, deleterious behaviors because they don't know better and they're struggling really badly. Yeah. And so you can have empathy you can strive if you can develop a closer relationship with them and provide feedback for them if you feel it's safe or worth it. Um, encourage they take that 360 and go do that coaching, but it's not your job to to transform for them. Yes. Uh, transformation is an inside out job. Yeah. All you can do is influence in a way that you feel is appropriate. Um provide feedback in ways and methods that feel appropriate, whether it's anonymous or not. Um, commit to your own practice of leadership and strive to search and find leaders that you would want to follow and work for, which by the way, could be folks on your team. Because mm -hmm. if you wait long enough, mm. someone on your team will eventually become more senior to you. And if you love them and they love you, go work for them, you know? So a few yeah. ideas. Yeah, no, I've seen it. And it's, it, I've seen the impact, right? Where it's been being able to control what you can control and just noticing those times where you're not, you're, I almost talk about putting a bubble around yourself and not energetically taking on their energy and being able to hold that boundary. And I've seen that with a lot of individuals, they've noticed how much the residue doesn't stay in the same way. Um, and like you said, looking for other ways to potentially stay within the same organization and work on other teams and 360s. Sometimes with 360, I haven't ever done a 360 where it hasn't been incredibly enlightening for every single leader for a variety of reasons. But I have had ones where it was that moment where they really realized it was a catalyst and they recognized that some of the maladaptive behaviors that they were using was not working for them anymore. And they can change, right? Where when I hear people say, no, it's done by the time they're in their sixties, like it's done and it's not good. Well, I have evidence to support the contrary yeah. many, many times. And however, the most important piece is what you just said, which there has to be a willingness and a desire to change. Ultimately, yeah. that's the piece we can't, we can want something very badly for somebody else. This can be in our relationships outside of work as well. We could want it so badly for them, but ultimately that individual has to take ownership and say, you know what, I do have a desire to change. And what I also appreciate, which I do as well, is also, listen, anybody who's experiencing that, I want you to feel validated. It is hard. It is shitty. It sucks. <laughs> There's times where it just feels like, I don't want to go to work today and have to deal with this again. And there's the dualities of both. You can be holding that to be true. And also what can you do to take care of yourself through that? Yeah. And you know, the only way to have a, have someone with narcissistic personality disorder change is ensure you surround them with people who say yes to them all the time. Right. That's, you know, there, there are some moments and I've worked for one before where there's someone who you know, I would guess is a narcissist, a, a legitimate, like there is narcissism, which is a healthy view of oneself. Yeah. And then there's narcissistic personality disorder yes. where those types of folks take next to zero responsibility or, or accountability and, and don't want to grow. Um, you know, but to your point, if, if you have someone who's willing to look in the mirror and willing to do it with with another as well, a coach, a friend, a facilitator, a colleague, a mentor, um, growth is possible regardless of age. Yes, yes. And I'm sure everyone, I won't give any names, but I'm sure there's some people you can see out there in the world right now that might be having some of those behaviors of that narcissism. And you know what that looks like when somebody doesn't want to change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chad, I feel like we could talk for hours, uh, but I always like to give my guests an opportunity to leave whatever's on your mind right now as a final thought. I would say, um, so two things. One is as a leader, your whisper is a shout and your tiptoes are stomps. And so know that if you are in a formal role of leadership or you behave as a leader and have followers, people are listening and people are watching. Um, and the other is uh, when the human in me sees the human in you, we make progress. Uh, 
Mm. And we need a lot more of that, not just in our organizations, but in the world today. Um, that we live in a time where we don't need to be right. We just have to connect um, and hold space um, and understanding for others, for their point of view, for their feelings. Um, and so long as their feelings aren't at the expense of your oppression, we're good. We're yeah. good. Such, such good words of wisdom. So wise. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Thank you. Um, if you want to learn more about the book, head on over to speakupculture.com. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect on LinkedIn. And our company website is shedinspires.com. Amazing. We will share all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here today, Shed. My pleasure. We'll do a part two soon. Yes. And to everybody, wherever you are in the world, we are saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, sending tons of love. Bye-bye.